and welcome back. You find me in the L322, winding my way through forest tracks, just north of Tyrol in Spain. I've not done a review of the L322. I've certainly not done, I've not seen any reviews of anyone actually driving these things off road. Most of the reviews of these vehicles have been done on tarmac. Now this vehicle is a 2010 Range Rover Autobiography Black. This is one of 700 that were made to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Range Rover. It's a UK model. It's me driving on this side of the road. This is a turbo diesel. It's a V8 and it's 4.4 litres. This one has been remapped. So this is pumping out close to 360 brake horsepower. I'm not sure the numbers on torques, on Newton meters and torque, but I can tell you low down, it has got some serious grunt now that it's been remapped. Things that I've done for this vehicle to make it a bit more responsive is that I have K&N filters. The remap of course helps. And then I've removed the rear exhaust box Number one, to save weight, and number two, to get all the exact exhaust gases out of the, uh, the engine quicker. So that big exhaust box you see on the L322 has been replaced by twin exhaust pipes with really small silencers. So the benefit of that is you get a really nice V8 burble, and it's got that. And I'll put a link in the description to what it sounds like. And you also get that rasp when you really put your foot down. Now a couple of things on a remap. I have noticed by having the car remapped that it has made it far more responsive low down, so going away from traffic lights, roundabouts, those sorts of things. It makes it a lot more responsive, so I think that's a positive. Fuel. My fuel consumption has gone up to about 35 miles per gallon. So I've gone well over 3,000 kilometers, sorry that's not in miles because I've got it set to kilometers. But I've seen it improve. Uh, the way things are with gas, diesel, petrol prices today, I think the remap has probably saved me some money by going through it. Now you've seen reviews of the L322, people talking about what it's like on road, and I have nothing else to add to that. It is superb on road. It is comfortable, it is smooth and it glides along. The air suspension is phenomenal. But what's it like off-road? Well, I'm on some fairly easy forest gravel tracks and it is really comfortable. The air suspension soaks up any imperfections in the trail. You can see from my overhead shot here what it looks like. But it is smooth, the steering is light and precise. The creature comforts in here are just phenomenal. I'm in 28 degree weather, and those of you that are in Imperial old school money, that's 82 degrees Fahrenheit. I've got my cooled seats on, on setting number two. So I've got nice cool air wafting up my back. So I'm not sitting to these really nice soft leather seats and sweating. And when you do this type of driving, or even if you're in the car, I don't particularly like AC, not unless it gets really hot and oppressive do I put my AC on. But having the ability to turn these cool seats full blast allows this nice cool air to go off your back. So you don't end up sticking to the seat. You don't end up with sweat on your legs on the weather. It's just very, very comfortable. Now this vehicle has gone through many modifications to turn it into the way I need it. And the first thing I've got is I have a rail from a company called 67 Designs that is self-tapped into the very end of where this leather, this gorgeous leather dashboard sits. And what that allows me to do is to attach a number of different devices to different arms. So you're looking at me with a 67 Design Series 55 rail on a 20 mil ball on what they call their medium carbon fiber arm and that is attached to a GoPro mount. On the other side I've got two mounts 
And because of the rake of the windscreen, I have an iPad on there as well. And I also have the ability to put, or an iPad mini, sorry. But I also have the ability to put my Garmin in reach. Most of the trails that I do, do have 3G. But today, I'm on a trail that doesn't. And so my Garmin inReach Mini is Bluetooth directly to my iPad Mini, so I can stay connected and follow the trail. So that is a great upgrade, especially if you're going to do this sort of driving. The navigation system on this vehicle, the factory one, is 12 years old now, and certainly doesn't have anywhere near um, the detail that you would get if you had a modern uh, Google Maps or an Apple CarPlay. Now I also have something called a Navi Plus and that is from a company in Australia and they make a connector with the steering wheel controls that allow you to run Apple CarPlay into the original Land Rover, Range Rover audio system. So now I have Google Maps on my system. I also have the ability to do all of the things that you could do if you have Apple CarPlay. So there's two things that I generally do, Google Maps and music. Now there are other options on the L322. They do have an old iPod connector and you can buy something called a Bovi, which is a Bluetooth. I found problems with that because that would play probably only about a dozen songs and then it would just go back onto loop. So I found it really difficult to deal with and in the end uh, I think it's sitting in a drawer somewhere and I went with a Navi Plus. Primarily because I had a Defender and my Defender I had Apple CarPlay head unit which was retrofitted. I love it and it just makes life a lot easier. And unfortunately technology today does dictate what we want in our vehicles and I wanted Apple CarPlay. A few other things on the off-road mode. Now having had a Defender, which I would consider to be analog, meaning driver input, this is night and day. This is totally different in the fact that everything is controlled for you electronically. I was a tad skeptical when I first got in this vehicle and started driving off-road whether it really would be as good as it was made out to be when it was built. And by that I mean all the electronic wizardry that is on this car, people say it's too complex. It's not necessary. But I disagree with that. I think this allows you to focus on driving and not focus on the other things that you have. Now some people can argue and say, well that's the fun of going off-road, being able to do the driver inputs. So a couple of things, I can put this thing into low range. And because of the low down torque that has now been unleashed by having the uh, ECU remapped, it is extremely powerful low down. And I can monitor it with the gears as it selects itself automatically through that. But generally when it's in low range and you're going up uh, fairly steep hills, it will sit there and go between gear two and gear three. And I've watched it bounce backwards and forwards between those gears. The other thing this vehicle has, which a lot of L322s and Discovery 3s and 4s don't have, is this has a locking rear diff as standard. So the Autobiography Black came with every single optional extra that Land Rover had at the time. So this has a locking rear differential. Most L322s, in fact, I would guess 90% of the L322s on the road today do not have a locking diff. A couple of reasons for that. When people bought these vehicles, it was an optional extra. And I think, as it's already been proven, close to 85% of Range Rovers have never ever seen dirt or gravel or you know, the type of road tracks that I'm doing today. So as an optional extra, and I'm not sure what it costs, we're probably talking a couple of thousand pounds, a couple of thousand dollars. If people looked at it and thought, well, we're never going off-road, we don't need it. It was never chosen as an optional extra. And it's very difficult to retrofit them. Number one, you've got to find a locking rear diff. And two, you've got to try and look at the electronics to get it retrofitted. So when I looked at these vehicles, I was really, really adamant that I wanted an autobiography blank because I knew that it would have a locking rear diff original. Now one thing 
on the special programs. I've tried every one but snow. Thankfully I don't live in the snow belt. I don't think this vehicle is ever going to see snow. All of the others I've tried. And I can safely say that it has handled everything that I've thrown at this vehicle. Now, I am not doing Moab type rock crawling and I'm definitely not doing boulder crashing. But I firmly believe that it could do it with the suspension the way it is, being able to pump it up and go on to high mode, I think you could, this vehicle could definitely do it. And if it could do it, it will do it in absolute comfort and luxury. It won't be bucking around, it won't be rocking and rolling. It would be comfortable. So I think with a locking rear differential, it would definitely be able to do those sorts of uh, trails that you might want to take this vehicle. Now one thing I've done to this vehicle is I put all-terrain tyres on it and to me that has unlocked 50% of this vehicle. Now you can drive this vehicle off-road with road-based tyres but to be honest with you as soon as you hit anything really difficult you're going to struggle. All-terrain tyres and I have Cooper Discoverer 80 Sport 3s have gone up in a couple of sizes. These are 275 55s. So it gives me a wider tyre, but it also gives me a better sidewall. Now I've got a problem with this vehicle. Most people would like to go to 16 or 18 wheels, but because I've got six pot Brembo calipers on the front, it's almost impossible to fit an 18 inch wheel to those uh, over those calipers. So this is sitting on L405, they're called model 066 rims. The offset, which I don't remember offhand, pushes them further out of the vehicle and it fills the wheel arches nicely. And with a better, deeper profile of tire, I think it makes the car stance look much better than on the fairly skinny 31 inch tires that this vehicle comes with. So there's a couple of things that I've done to sort of bring it up to 2020 standards, if you will. So I've replaced every single incandescent bulb. So I'm now running LEDs right the way through the interior of the cab. They're really easy to pop out and pop in. So I have LEDs throughout the vehicle. I've also changed the rear reverse lights. I've got LEDs on there. I've changed the high beam lights and I have LEDs. I've left the HIDs in place in favor of just going with some new Osram units. And I think they were beginning to yellow. And so what I did was just switch them out to some new ones and now they really are nice and crisp and white. that I don't think people truly appreciate on this vehicle. This has a digital dash and in 2010 when this car was built I can't think of many vehicles that actually had a digital dash in them. This dash I spend a lot of time staring at it especially when you put in the special programs or you put it into low range. Automatically the speedo when you put it into low range shifts so you are doing off-road, you don't need to see the speedo doing 50 or 60 mile an hour because the chances are you're not going to be doing that. So in order to get more space, more, more information on the dash, the speedo moves itself to the right and hides 50% of it. And that allows you to see things like the vehicle steering input. You can see which way your steering wheel is going. You can also see how the differentials are working as well. So in a special program, you can see the center diff and the rear diff, and they have little locks on them, padlocks. So most of the time they stay green, they're unlocked, and the vehicle is just controlling itself through a combination of traction control and the programs that are built into the special programs or 
the terrain response modes. And I currently have this one on gravel. So to put the vehicle into low range, you stop. You turn the dial to neutral. You hit the low range button. Put the vehicle back into drive. And then you see this glorious, beautiful colored screen. It really is, considering it's 12 years old, and I know the new ones probably look 10 times better than this, but it's just gorgeous. It's everything you want to see. You know you're in low range. You can see the revs. You can see what the vehicle's doing itself around the differentials, as I mentioned, your steering input. But more, more importantly, you can see the types of terrain. You can see your wheels, where they're positioned. And then you also have the hill descent system. And the hill descent system, it's one of these things that I thought was just a gimmick, but I have tried it. I've tried it a number of times and I love it. And I think there's a number of reasons why I love it. In more analog cars, a Defender, I spend a lot of time either in letting the car engine brake itself, or if you feel like it's going too fast, you generally hit the brakes and I know it's not what you're supposed to do but you just instinctively will hit the brakes or dab them. With this you don't need to worry about it. I've been down some fairly steep hills. And what I love about it is you can just put the hill descent system in and it will just pulse the ABS and gradually figure out through all the different wizardry that's going on with this electronics the best way to be able to get that vehicle down that incline safer and more comfortable. And I've tried in various different situations, one towards the edge of a cliff, and it was just superb. It was controlled. And I think if anything, that's the word that I would use for the hill descent system. It was controlled. Now people knock these vehicles of being unreliable. And touch wood, there is wood in this vehicle. I've not had any major problems with it. Now I've had niggly little faults and that's to be expected from a vehicle that's 12 years old. So I've had one of my the driver's side heated seat, the element, the plastic element under it cracked and I replaced that. I've also got a problem at the moment where the cruise control which uses a radar box in the front underneath the bumper is also throwing up codes and it's not working. But I think that's to be expected from a vehicle of this age and with the type of technology it has. So yes, I do have niggly little problems. Well, so I've got full service history with this vehicle. And that was one of the things I highly recommend if you're going to buy one of these. Make sure you get the full service history. At least you know what's been done to it. So by having the full service history, I know, and this was taken care of by a, uh, a Land Rover dealer, I know that things like the gearbox oil was changed when it was supposed to be changed, even though that they say they're sealed for life, it was changed at 80,000 miles. I know both rear shocks have been changed, and I have adaptive suspension on this one. So both of those have been done. I also know that both front airbags have been replaced. So I think having full service history gives you peace of mind to know what the vehicle has and has not gone through, uh, what's replaced. These ones, the twin turbo, turbo, turbo diesel V8, 4.4, are notorious for having both turbos leaking and the EGR valves leaking. So I also have uh, the receipt of both turbochargers that have been replaced with new seals and new jars have been done as well. So lastly, let's look at what this vehicle is like on the road. So the last thing is, what's this vehicle like on the road? And as many people have done it far better justice than I can do it on reviews of the L322, it is superb. It is probably one of the most comfortable, smoothest, easy to drive cars I've ever had. And I've had an L322, one of the BMW, one of the very first ones in 03. 
this is just totally different to what that vehicle felt like, its drivability, and its comfort level. Now because this is the L322 Black, every touch surface here is black leather. It's got black piano wood dash. The one I had originally had a rosewood colored finish to it, which you sort of got used to. I actually liked it. My other one was black um, and it had black seats. And the contrast between the sort of reddish wood, it was okay, it was live, I could live with it. But this one is just, it's night and day comparison um, to that early L322 I had. The brakes on this are incredible. Now having Brembo brakes and having six pop front calipers and four in the back, this is a heavy vehicle. This is weighing close to three tons, if not three tons. And so when you hit the brakes, you definitely feel it beginning to throw down the boat anchors and slow it down. And it's excellent, even in wet, even with all-terrain tires, it stops in a straight line. I've not done any emergency braking with it, but it, they are more than adequate for the vehicle. hear some wind noise I have a rooftop tent and a roof rack so there's absolutely nothing you can do to stop the wind over the top of the tent or around the roof rack it's just going to happen you get used to it but when I first had this vehicle without a roof rack it was silent it was so quiet you can't hear the engine in this vehicle you literally cannot hear the engine when you cruise about 70 mile an hour, 120 kilometers at about 13 to 1400 RPM, it is so quiet and so smooth. So a few other things I've done to the vehicle, basically to make it a little bit more modern, is that I've switched out my rear view mirror. Now I use this vehicle for more off-roading overland, and so I've got a lot of gear in the back. And with the original rear view mirror, you couldn't see out the back. There's too much stuff stacked there. So I have something called an Autobox V5 Pro. This replaces the original rear view mirror. There is a camera hidden in the tailgate that basically looks backwards. So I bypass everything that's in the back seats and off my dog guard and stacked up the back there. So I have a rear view uh, clear view out the back of the vehicle. So these are also front and rear dash cams as well. And there's plenty of times when I've gone off road and I haven't got footage. You can use the SD card in here and just download the, uh, the footage. So these switchbacks, you can feel the car. I'm doing about 30 mile an hour and it is so comfortable and smooth on these roads. Minimal weight put onto the steering wheel. It just glides along. It takes these relatively sharp hairpin bends with ease. There are no squeaks or rattles in here. There were a few little niggly things that I had. This door seal used to squeak, but I've replaced it. More that the rubber has perished with people opening and closing the door consistently on the driver's side. So I've replaced the door seal. And that's got rid of the sort of squeaking you get with rubber on metal. But this car is 12 years old. It has done close to 143,000 miles. And I can honestly say, it feels like it's only a few years old. It truly is an incredible vehicle. And 
you can knock these vehicles as much as you want. You can call them unreliable. You can go down a whole list of things that's wrong with them and why you should never buy one. But you're wrong. Go out and buy a good one. Take care of it. Look after it. Service it when it needs it. You too will be able to drive an L322 and say that they are incredible vehicles. To me, this is the last shape of the Range Rover that heralds back to the original two-door, four-door classics. The old 405 took it in a completely different direction. You could not off-road that thing, but you're going to do significant damage to it. This one you can still off-road. Now there are some things you need to be careful of. The ramp over, departure angle, approach angles, you need to be considerate before you take it off road. Now the suspension will raise itself up and there are other things you can do, either if you've adapt or to raise the suspension even further. Or like I have, I have something called an easy lift kit, which gives me the ability through an app to raise up my suspension higher than standard. But just be considerate if you do go off-road. Just look at the approach angles because the spoiler at the front does hang down quite a bit. The rear, because of the tailpipes um, and the bumper overhang, you need to be considerate of that too. Now for me, in wrapping this up, the L322, especially the facelifted model that I've got, the 10 to 12, is the most iconic Range Rover there is. You can look back at the classic, and I love the classic. I've had four classics, all four doors. But the L322 to me is the best looking Range Rover after the Sudor Classic. It's iconic. The shape is just phenomenal. And I believe this is one of the best cars ever made. Now you can argue the point that they're unreliable. You can argue the point until the cows come home. But there are some of us who absolutely love these vehicles. And no matter what you say, no matter how much money we potentially have to put into them to fix them, you will not get us to disagree. So in my opinion, for what it's worth, I believe that the L322 Autobiography Black is the best Range Rover ever built. Argue away, say I'm wrong, but it's my opinion. So I've hoped you enjoyed this review. I think this is probably the only off-road review of the L322 that's ever been done. So I really hope you enjoyed this review of the L322, both on-road and off-road. Please like the video if you like the video. And with that, I'll see you on the next one. Cheers.